I've been blessed with spending some time from him. Uh, I like people from Minnesota. And... Uh, <laughs> and he said, no, Jerry, you're going to have to introduce Bob W. And I said, oh, hell. Uh, <laughs> Now, I've been trying hard, trying hard. I, Bob, they made it as easy for me as they could. Bob came by in his motor home and, and drove me up here and has given me a good dose of Bob Whiteism all the way up here. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, Mercer, I'm sorry. I talked to Mercer earlier, and I said, uh, Mercer, uh, you know Bob has stopped chewing. And if you could, just when I make this announcement here about Bob stopping chewing for two months, if you could break into a little melody of, Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Uh, <laughs> that'd be good. <laughs> I expected him to levitate when he, when he gave that up, but I, there must be a couple of other little things we don't know about yet. That, uh... <laughs> uh, one of the, uh, seriously, one of the, uh, one of the principles that is important that makes something like this work is freely you have been given, freely you shall give. Freely you receive, freely give. Bob Marceline went to a conference in uh, Cook's Forest, Pennsylvania many years ago, and they felt some of what you're feeling here. And they knew what they found there was good enough for their friends, and their friends ought to have that sort of thing. So they came back and they started a thing called Brownwood and Jack and Pat and a lot of Johnny and all of you uh, that participated in Brownwood have known what blessings came out of that. A little later, they started a thing called Cedar Glen. And a little later, an outfit called Brazos. And out of the same format came the Canyon Creek Conference. And that's heavy stuff, you know. It's good, it's fun to go to an AA conference with Bob White. You, ha you laugh a lot. But the thing that's really remarkable is how many people know they are Bob White's friend. You just really are. If I ask people, I won't do this, but if you ask people to hold up their hand who were Bob White's friend, most of the people in this room would hold up their hand. And the reason for that is he has received a great gift, and he freely gives it away. He received acceptance. He received love. He received concern, and he has passed that on. That's our legacy, you see. If we don't pass it on, it stops here. And once in a while, we run across a guy who really does it real good. For a long time, he keeps the faith. Your friend and mine, Bob White. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> I hope the people here who are maybe at an AA conference for the first time who possibly are friends of AA rather than AA members know that we mean no sacrilege at all with a statement like I just made. I just thought it's funny. <laughs> My name is Bob White, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> and by God's grace, and because this program does continue to work one day at a time in my life, I have not had a drink since August the 12th, 1954. And for this period of sobriety, I am absolutely overjoyed, and I am indeed grateful for it. Today is one of the days that I have to be most grateful. You know, I'm really not a very good AA speaker. I have just been here a long time, and you are giving me my just dues. Isn't that right, Zach? And uh, I'm worthy of every bit of it. Thank you, Zach.
Jerry so wonderfully well talked about your Canyon Conference. And let me suggest to you that this might be one of the most single important events that you will ever experience in your AA life, the first Canyon Conference. I have been privileged to be at the first Brownwood, the first Cedar Glen, the first Brazos, and now the first Canyon Conference. And it's with some type of pride that I say that. I don't think that it's the type of pride that will cause me any problems. But I think it's a good kind of pride. I am proud of the fact that I have been at the inception of each of these four conferences. You possibly be, would be unaware of this fact. Several thousand people's lives have been changed as a result of the experiences that they share at these conferences. As Jerry told you, Cook's Forest, Pennsylvania, just a few miles from Titusville, Pennsylvania, was the first conference of this nature that AA ever experienced. A few years later, there were people from the Virginia area who started one exactly like this at Blackstone, Virginia. And then there was one started at Brownwood, Texas. Today, there's approximately 25 of them scattered about all over the United States. They have them at uh, a little island off the coast of Georgia, two or three in the Carolinas. They have one that's directly across the valley from Billy Graham's home. And there's this beautiful valley. Billy Graham lives on this side of it, and this side of it, there's a Baptist camp. And the AAs two times a year meet there. Even the formats of these type conferences are just about the same. And the people who are in attendance there are deriving a good that is unparalleled in the life of people like you and me. And I think that all of us here today, every one of us, could better ourselves and our AA experience in, in this life if we committed to the fact that this place would have our support. You know, and that's really not too big a deal. I commit today that the Canyon Conference has my support. And you know that doesn't even mean that I have to be here every time. It just means that in my heart of hearts that I know I love what I've experienced right while I was here. And I know there's meaning to the things that the people have said. And I support the Canyon Conference. And you believe me, I will always support it the Canton Conference. It's a vital importance to me that you and I perpetuate what you have started here this weekend. And I love you for being here. There are people in this room, and I'm not totally free of fantasy. Fantasizing nearly destroyed me. So I like to say that I'm a dreamer, <laughs> which is really okay. And if I were not careful today, I would fantasize about there are some people in this room today that I would give my life. I really would. You people and others like you have touched me in a manner that I have never, ever been touched. You have touched places within me that's opened up other places where feeling has come about in my life that I didn't know I had. Jesus, there were, you know, there's several cops that would never have believed that I was tender. <laughs> but I can reach up and touch Octavia on the face or hug a man, a Jerry or a Bob or a Jim, and something happens. Just inside me, something happens. And you see, that's your gift to me. I didn't create it. It was never mine. I really know what it is. Maybe I'll talk about it a little later. You know, uh, for about, I think it's six or eight months, I can't remember too well. Uh, other people have mentioned that my memory of had 
trouble with it lately. <laughs> I, I can't remember who it was that said. <laughs> I said, what was I talking about? Uh, where was I? Six or eight months. Is that a term of pregnancy or what? <laughs> Quite obvious, I need a new place. What'd you say? <laughs> yeah, it really is. If you think this embarrasses me, you got another thing coming. <laughs> yeah. Feelings. I swear to goodness, I don't know what happened six or eight months ago. <laughs> and it's okay. Uh, six or eight months ago, I uh, started talking about power and the lack of power. And uh, I had talked about it so often that I was I had fully intended to take off in a little different direction as I told my story not change my story thing but as I told my story to take off in a little different direction today and I couldn't believe it on Friday night when Mercer sang before the first speaker talked and he sang about a power and he called it in his song a higher power, higher power. And, and I instantly knew what I was supposed to do today and I have not deviated from that thought since I heard Mercer sing Friday night you know early early on in our big book it says these words and these have been mentioned I think by Jack that the lack of power was our real dilemma it didn't say that drinking liquor was our dilemma or a bad marriage was our dilemma or our inability or failure to be financially in the black and it didn't say anything about the power that had to do with relationship with people it said the lack of power was our dilemma our dilemma in all things in this business called living life. The lack of power was our dilemma. Now later on, just a little later on in the big book, it says these words. Further on, clear-cut instructions will be given for each of us. And if we follow these instructions at the end of the ninth step, guess what it says? And now the power has been added. The power to be what we have never, ever had the power to be or become. For the very first time, the power's at it. Now, I believe that the power has always been there. The phrase, the power has now been added, what that means is, that's my recognition of something that has always existed within me and has been a part of my life, except I didn't know it. That's what I ate that's done for me. It's given me the ability to see who I really am and the experience that has always been a part of my insides. And you see, for all of these many years, I went about trying to make my outsides be totally different to what my insides were. And I stayed in a state of rebellion and confusion every making moment of my life. <clears throat> I believe that there are people here today 
as surely as I'm standing here, who are in a state of transition toward becoming totally transparent. I mean that at some later date, I do not know when or where, that there are some people in this room who, if you observe them, would appear as if they were a pane of glass because they have, will have lived their life at this moment in time in the future to where their insides exactly match their outsides. And whoever and whatever it is that they portray to the likes of you and me, that will be what they are on the inside of them. No subterfuge. No put on in their happiness and in their joy and possibly occasionally in their sorrow. They will still be exactly on the outside the way they are on the inside. And you see, that's the magnificence of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's our direction in that area. I hope that someday I make enough progress that my outsides sort of match my insides. Now that's my pilgrimage. That's what I'm about. That's the road AA has set my feet on to help me become transparent to you. I don't have to hide anything anymore from any of you. I want you to know exactly who I am because it makes my trip easier. <clears throat> when I was a little boy, I was a pretty keen kid in most ways. I had a fine, loving family, and I was a total misfit. Just, you could not have been more of a misfit in my family than I was. I was just hyper all the time. From the moment I got out of bed and put my shoe on if it was winter time or took my first step as a barefooted kid. I just seemed as if I set out to get in trouble. That's what they said. <laughs> and later on, they started having meetings about me. <laughs> and you believe me, when they get together, you better watch out because some bad stuff's coming down on you, I'll tell you that. <laughs> There's places that they can send you and there's, they cut you off from certain things. And they just do all kinds of stuff if you don't watch out. Well, that's the way, my, that's the way I was as a kid. I got a mighty, I just, everything I did just went to, got messed up. Now, would you believe that my intentions were A, one okay, and that I purposely would set out to be totally different than I'd been the day before? And I wouldn't get my first step started. And just something would happen. It just really did. I didn't know it then. But even as a little boy, I wanted to please. Now the way you see, oh, Bob did the greatest job last night. Never, ever have I heard anyone talk about step six and seven as good as he did. It was magnificent. But he also talked about if he and his parents got to write down the way they wanted him to be, that strangely enough, that what he wrote down and what they wrote down would be about the same. But they would never believe that he wrote that down because that's not the way he was or the way he acted. But that's the way he wanted to be. And I'm like Bob, and all of y'all were like Bob. We didn't want to be like we were. You know why we weren't like they wanted us to be and like we would like to have been? Do you really know why? because we didn't have the power to change what we were. We just really didn't have the power. I kept adding a few years to my life, and after a while I grew up old enough to notice girls, and I fell so madly in love with Marceline. She lived next door to me. And I guarantee you I didn't do this, because I'm not that kind of fellow. But she swears that I would walk around in my backyard singing, Love Thy Neighbor. 
Now that's kid stuff. And I wouldn't do that. Boy, I tell you, I fell for her hook, line, and sinker. A lot of y'all think she's really pretty today. And I've noticed some of the most lecturers of you have, you know, 65 years old, but you still look. <laughs> I've noticed some of you. <laughs> you just, you ought to, just should have seen her when she was about 19. You know what our total conversation amounted to for about a year? Hers was don't and mine was please. <laughs> She's so precious. You know, just like some of you people in this room. There wasn't anything I wouldn't have done for her. I was such a young guy, and I had aspirations and ideals, and I made plans. But God, I wanted to show her how much I loved her by becoming the best husband that all of West Texas had ever seen. And I put every bit of energy that I had into this thing of becoming the singular best husband. I wanted to be the husband that every girl in town became jealous of Marcelina. About. I wanted to be that good. I wanted to be the kind of husband to my wife as a young man, I did, that all the mothers in town would urge their daughters to try to find one at least second best to me. That's, I really did. And I didn't have the power to do it. And the strangest thing happened. If I could have been second or third best, I might have been able to live with it. I was 148 best or 612th or something. I was the sorriest excuse for a husband that you have ever seen. <laughs> and all the time it was happening, I wanted to be different than I was. Does anyone here understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> Jesus, I, want, I wanted so badly to be something other than what I was. You know, I was raised in a Baptist home, and it was a good Baptist home. When I was, I was trying to remember, I was either nine or ten, and I had a new burro that was exceptional. You know, most burros jig or trot. And that's just about the best you can get out of one. This dude run. If you get way back on the back end of him, put a sur single on him and set way just to just nearly fall off the back end with long lines on him, you know, range, he'd really run. And I was prouder of that damn jackass than anything I had ever had in my life. And the Baptist church that mother and dad took all those kids to had a revival, and it was in the summertime. It was just so hot, you just couldn't have it in church. They had tabernacles. The only difference in that tabernacle on this one, this one had a dirt floor. It had brush arbor type thing. And I've been to lots of meetings in brush arbor tabernacles. And the primary difference, though, was the center at a center aisle rather than these aisles here. And it was about this size. And my mother played the piano, and my daddy led the choir in singing. And they had a little 20 or 15 or 20 member choir back up here. And uh, I slept out of the tabernacle. I was absolutely bored to death. And it was only about three or four blocks from our house, and I went over, and I just wanted to check on my burro. That's, that's all I wanted to do, just check on it. <laughs> My intentions were good. 
Well, while I was there, I thought I might as well put that little rope halter on him and ride him around the cow lot a time or two. <laughs> and Mercer, I did it. <laughs> so I thought, well, I could ride him back over. It's about four blocks of the house to the tabernacle and tie him up to a little mesquite tree around the edge of it someplace. And no one did ever know that. And I got up to this back end of this thing and that jackass looked in that place. And fellas, you know, a lot of times AA speakers have been known to make up tales. This God can strike me dead if this ain't so right now. <laughs> I got the Budo. Occasionally they act like AAs. They get out of hand. <laughs> and he took over and walked into the tabernacle with me jerking on him as hard as I could. And my father was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother wheeled around as if she had got some news about a world disaster <laughs> and two or three of the deacons jumped up the donkey messed in the floor <laughs> and they jerked me off that jackass <laughs> I have never been unseated as quickly as I was that night and all kind of trouble and guess what I didn't any more plan for that to happen <laughs> and I didn't have any more power over my life than I did of keeping that jackass walking down the aisle I really did but you see I just constantly was at some sort of war or battle or problem and I didn't know what was going on except I was troubled by it I didn't know how to name it. I couldn't identify it. I was a little old kid. That's all I was. I just couldn't identify what my problem was. And my problem was a lack of power was my real dilemma. That's all it was. Nothing else. I remember going to these Baptist meetings. And God, I just love every bit of them. I love the people. I love the songs they sing. I love all that. I asked Mercy the other night because he does this type of work. If he had ever one time heard a minister say that man's power of choice is not to be good or to be bad, the only choice that God has ever given man is to be willing to let God change him for the better. I have never ever from a pulpit heard one time a minister, and this isn't criticism, I'm not saying, please do not think that. I'm only reporting a situation that I didn't understand. I thought I had been given the power to change what I was. And do you, would you believe that I nearly destroyed myself trying to change myself? What little sanity that alcohol had left me later on, what little sanity that I had, I nearly used it up trying with every fiber of my being to be what other people expected of me, partially, but also what I had always suspicioned I could have been. I had always suspicioned what I could have been. I really did have it within me to be a fine husband and a good daddy and a good businessman and a friend. I thought it was in here, and I didn't have the power to get it on. Just didn't have the power. My life from the time I was about 16, and it wasn't too good up to that point, I started downhill because that's when I took my first drink. And there was a form of power added to my life at that point. Whatever it was that I had secretly wanted to be but did not seem to be able to get there, it seemed as if, as if at least some of that was added to my life when I took a drink. I could take two or three drinks. And it was just magic. Indecision, inability, apprehension, all of those things seemed to just gradually fade out of my life and on a temporary basis, I became what I'd always suspicioned that I'd had the capacity to be. 
I'm going to tell you something. Who wouldn't drink if they got that kind of an experience from it? Who wouldn't drink? Repetition strengthens and confirms habit. Repetition strengthens and confirms habit. Now, once I found what a marvelous thing happened as a result of me drinking, I gradually came to use alcohol repetitiously. And repetition strengthens and confirms habit. And it became a habit for me to drink in time of trouble. There was an inner calling, an urging that went beyond desire and later was called compulsion. That when things did not go well, if I drank, things would get better. You know, those people criticize us sometimes. You know, they really get on our case about this habit. And you know, every one of them have habits that they enjoy so much they won't give up. And the one that I like to talk about the most is how many people in this room sleep on a pillow. Now, I'm sure every one of you do, or nearly all of you. But have you tried it lately without a pillow? You just roll and toss all night. Now, there's nothing wrong with the habit of sleeping on the pillow. That's We can call that a good habit if you want to. But the reason why you can't sleep without a pillow is because you've done it so often it has become a habit. Repetition strengthens and confirms habit. And I drank repetitiously because of certain conditions in my life until it became a habit, and I didn't know I had the habit. One of my all-time, all-time favorite people in AA said many, many years ago, the chains that bind us are never felt until it's too late to break them. Everyone finally became able to recognize that I was held in bondage and chained with this problem called alcoholism. I didn't know it. I was the very last one to know. The chains that bind us are never felt until it's too late to break them. Let me tell you about how I drank, and I can be all through with that. It won't take but a minute. Last night we had one of the real delights of this Canyon Conference was that bonfire and marshmallow roast. It was Jerry and I talked this morning. You know, he's a high-powered lawyer. <laughs> Got 240 <laughs> members of his firm. He really is a big shot. <laughs> <laughs> and he was sitting out there enjoying a marshmallow roast. Well, I enjoyed it too. And we talked about it this morning. We really got up and talked about how much fun we had to marshmallow roast. And it made me remember about my drinking. You know, I carefully watched and mentioned it two or three. I said, watch that dude right there with his marshmallow. I said, when it gets just right, he won't be able to get it away from the fire <laughs> without it catching on fire. <laughs> now, let me tell you about my drinking. After they said that drinking was really about to do me in, and I suspicioned that I might have a small problem with it, I started to try to monitor my drinking, you know. And on one particular day, I would determine that it was probably the ninth drink that would slide me over some type of a line. I wasn't sure what the line represented, but I presumed that if I stayed on the left side of it rather than jumping over it, I might be better off. And, you know, it's a strange thing. I, I would take that ninth drink, and something happened. I, I just don't know if I'm thinking or something, and I'd take two or three more, and my marshmallow would catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I never could get it out of the fire before it exploded in flame. And I want to tell you, later on, when it became imperative that I do something about my drinking, but I didn't have the power to do it, God, I just went to all kind of trouble trying to monitor my drinking. I switched from this kind of drinking to that kind of drinking. I, I drank, you know, I tried to change my habits, but I tried everything I knew. One time I said, it's bound to be 
you know, it's just bourbon and all this other crap I was drinking. So I decided that there was one thing that couldn't hurt me and it was cream to mint. <laughs> I had been on a refinancing job. Now, the way I always refinance, I went to see my dad. <laughs> And I was living in Denver, and they were on the farm in Bosque County. So I went back to the farm and got a little, re, you know, refinancing business. And I got on an airplane and went back to Denver. Marceline met me at the airport. Now, in addition to this refinancing, we had a little prayer meeting a time or two, and we talked about my life. And you remember I told you, when they get together, you better watch out. And... They said they had a lot to say. Now, Dad never said anything, but Mother was a sayer. <laughs> and uh, they, I had a brother that was an attorney. And when they had a whole lot to say, they had always called Albuquerque and have him fly to Texas so he could get in on that. And he never did know why he was there, and I didn't either. <laughs> but they wanted him there because it seemed to do that, you know, there might be some use for some legal beagle or something. But anyway, I went back to Denver. And met Marceline at the airport, and I had the grand news. I'd been refinanced. That was number one. And number two, I'd stopped drinking. She said, you're kidding. I said, I really have. So we went into the, the bar there and sat down, and she ordered a Coke, and I ordered a double cream to mint. She said, I thought you'd stop drinking. Now, listen to what I'm going to tell you. As God is my maker, I didn't count that as drinking. I, I didn't know. I honest, a grown man didn't know. So for about a two-month period, I drank cream to mint. And I graduated from, you know, four or five doubles a day to half a gallon. <laughs> and Marceline came walking in one day with some of my underwear. And they were green as a gourd. <laughs> and my shirts, the armpits of them, were green. And I had this terrible green cast in my eyeballs <laughs> and when I would wipe preparation, perspiration from my head the handkerchief literally had a faint green stain on it I, half a gallon wasn't enough I drank a gallon a day and one day I decided I better not drink any more cream to mint and for the next four or five days, I thought I had experienced some things that were different in this life. <laughs> but green boogers. <laughs> you know, I, by that time, I was seeing all kind of weird stuff. You know, it's scared Marceline and the kids to death and having DTs and hallucinations and stuff. But I'm going to tell you when they all turned green on me. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to tell you is I just didn't have the power to change any of that crap in my life. And I wanted to worse than any human being that you have ever seen. Uh, even today, I think I might be a tad, not a whole lot embarrassed, if I gave a recitation and it only had to do with just exactly what I wanted to be. And it was it would be inspirational for you to read or hear. It really would. Because it didn't inspire me and I tried hard. But I didn't have the power to be different than what I'd become. My life finally reached total disaster. And my people, I, I had wound up in Mississippi. Now that doesn't mean I moved to Mississippi or anything like that. That just means I was in Mississippi. <laughs> And I really wasn't sure how I had gotten to Mississippi <laughs> or what I was doing. I really did. And uh, I had done these things to Canada and Mexico. And if I was in California, I would go to Florida. And, you know, wherever it was that there was, if the responsibility got very heavy. And I recognized my inability to be what I thought I ought to be. That's when I had to move to another place. Couldn't stand it any longer. The daily recognition of total failure was something I could not handle. Didn't even have the, you see, I didn't even have the power to handle that. Just couldn't hack it. 
And there were so many circumstances having to do with Marceline and the kids and the lack of money. And the, it just, it was finally, the bottom fell out. And they ran me down and started me, sane me up. Marceline had finally reached the end and she had quit me. And she and the children were taking a different direction. But my parents are just like your parents. They don't give up on you. They love me just like I said I love some of you. They would have given their life just to remove this problem from the scene. They would have both have experienced broken legs and broken arms or anything else that you can think of to help me. That's how much they love me. They absolutely love me more than they did their own life and wanted to help me and didn't know how. You see, guess what? Today, I recognize they were in the same boat I was in. They didn't have the power to change me. And they nearly wore themselves out and nearly destroyed the relationship, what little was left between me and them, in their efforts to make me into something other than what I was. Now, I was trying to become something other than what I was, and I was nearly destroying myself. They signed me up and they started taking me to psychiatrist in Dallas. And they, you know, the final summation was he's goofy. <laughs> now, I am not making that up. That was after all the trips in and out. They said, well, boy, this cat's just goofy. And they recommended that I be sent to an institution for a minimum period of time of 18 months. Now I'm through with all of that mess. And I'm about to close, but I've just got to tell you about the miracle. of God's grace in one guy's life to tell you that I was despondent is the biggest understatement that has been made since this conference started. I was at a place in time that was most peculiar and I've never ever experienced it before or since. I do think that for a brief period of time I had experienced in my life and I don't know whether you have or not. I hope some of you have had a touch of this. A surrender at absolute and total depth. And you know, guess what I surrendered to? Now, I have talked at churches, and I could just see them lean forward because they knew I surrendered my life to God. And that wasn't what it was. Or I surrendered to the idea that I'd work harder and I could finally become this good husband. And I had become a flat zero. My wife and my kids, position, prestige, and I had had all of that. I, I had had every bit of it. I'd had money. I had, I had had it all. It was all gone. And I didn't really care. I just was so defeated within myself that I didn't care. I've said several times that they called the lawyer brother down. And he asked me all kind of questions. There were a lot of messes that had to be straightened up. And I later thought about it. Had he have said, in addition to these other things, well, Bob, have you murdered anybody? I know exactly what I would have said. I said, well, I'm not for sure, but let me think about it. You see, I would have been willing to say yes if I had. I had got to the place that I had absolutely nothing to hide. And it was my only salvation. It was my only hope of later recovery, to be finally put in a place because of my pride. And I stood between me and the answer. Always I stood between me and the answer, and something, God, me, you, are probably circumstances directed by God's will, had to move me out so that God could be influential in my life. Now, the miracle is the way it came about. There was an old rancher cowboy in Midden who was a friend of our family. And he asked, my brother who died last year, who was a member of AA, said, Henry says, how is Bob doing? And he said, 
And Jame had never told anyone a family secret. He said, he's terrible. He's about to die drunk. Henry said, no kidding. Where is he? And he says, down at the ranch in Boston County with mother and dad. The wheel started to turn. They didn't ask me. But Henry and a man named Bob and a guy named Fillmore, they all have passed away. Made arrangements with my mother and dad to come and see me. And my mother and dad didn't know what they wanted. I had never heard the word Alcoholics Anonymous in my life. Now, it's exactly 335 miles from Midland, where I, they were, to where I was. Now, if you go there and go back, you go 670 miles. They, had not, they were not asked to come. Now, listen carefully. They were not asked to come. Carry the message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all of our affairs. A principle practiced in this instant. What was it? Gratitude. The manifestation of all the gratitude for their own sobriety. Here they came. They were not asked to come. But they were so grateful for what God had given them through the program of of Alcoholics Anonymous and its people, a brand spanking new life that they then were willing to go and share their experience, strength, and hope with me so that I too, if I so chose, could have what they had. The first day they were, I was so sick, I was still coming in and out of messes. Been a long time since that had creamed them in. I guess they were just brown. You know, but I was back on vodka at that time. But here came these three dudes, and an amazing—this even amazing today—and I've never known for sure which it was. They stayed three days and two nights, or vice versa, and I just don't know which it was. But I do know that the first day we were there, I, I just—I was so sick, and I, I wondered what in the name of heaven are these people doing here. Now, remember, Henry was fifteen or twenty years older than I. The old cowboy, soft talking, wore big hat and high heel boots. Born and raised on ranches. Fillmore, another cowboy. And Bob was a traveling salesman. I wouldn't ask them, but there they were. I, the only thing that sunk in my head the first day is not one of those guys asked me why I did it just exactly like you've previously heard in these meetings here. Now, I, I, I kind of caught on to that. Nobody asked me why I'd done it. Henry was, I think, the world's champion 12 step And the reason why he was good at it, he practiced doing it until he just got su super smooth. And because he was so good at it, he was able to get me to respond to something. I responded a tiny bit, and then, because of his unique ability, he got me to talk just a tiny bit. And that's when I first heard the magic, the all-time magic of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Whatever it was that I said, Henry and the other two guys instantly said, why, Bob, we understand. And my God, not one person, not one person one time, even those that love me, had ever been able to say they understood. I want to tell you guys something. Every agency in the world is trying to get in on our act. And I'm not opposed to any of them. Boy, I tell you, if they can do some good, fine. You know? And I have been asked to be part of programs, and sometimes I will and sometimes I don't. But I've never heard one of them, never saw one of them that had the ability to sit down with me, and I still am a troubled person from time to time. 
I still have things that go on in my life that exist between me, maybe even my wife, or my kids, or some circumstance comes about. Now, they don't happen often anymore. They really don't. But sometimes, you know, it still happens. I'm going to tell you who I want to talk to. And a bunch of you here in this room. I want to talk to the guy who says, Why, Bob, I understand. Maybe not with an exactness, but I too have experienced a similar thing. And let me share mine with you. And that is called the language of the heart. And it just fills me up. Man, I have got I've got the world beat. I've got the bear by the tail and I can handle him. Because I always know where I can go if I hurt. And I go to you. And nobody charges me anything for it. And please don't take that as that I'm knocking somebody. I'm just not. I'm just reporting the way I feel and who I am and what I am. My God, you are my people. And I cannot, I literally cannot survive without you. You see, a lot of the power comes through you. Part, it's always been within me. I just never could recognize it. Your power is you've helped me in the recognition of where the power really is. Six or seven years ago, we had a daughter named Sandy. And after a two-year siege of cancer, she died. She died in circumstances that are so miserable that it's, I, I just have to get outside of myself to be able to relate this story to you. They're that bad. But they had told us in Houston that there was no chance for her life. She was doomed to die with this problem. And Marceline and I started to taking her all over the country. And we wound up in Tecate, Mexico, after being to other places. And we had gone all through the course of the layup trail treatment. And then those doctors said she could not be helped. So we went to whoever. It didn't make any difference. And she died in Tecate, Mexico. And I don't know whether any of you have ever been to Tecate, but it's terrible. And one of the, our twin daughters and Marceline and I were there at the time and she passed away. And I was not aware of this, but there's all kinds of things that have to transpire to get a body from one foreign country to another. It's just, uh, it's so tough that you can't hardly handle it because of your emotions. And I wanted someone with me so badly that I just I cried about it. But I couldn't leave Marceline or Susan alone, and they had to be there. So I got in the car and took off from Ducati to San Diego, California. And that particular day was foggy, and there's not a blade of grass in that area. It's just rocks, and it's the most arid place I have ever seen. I remember many years ago of seeing some artist had drawn pictures, and they did it quite well, of Dante's Inferno. This was an 1800, late 1800s rendition of this artist's concept of Dante's Inferno. And there's goblin and twisted trees, and there's rocks. And it's a hard-looking thing, this picture. And I remembered that picture while I was driving in that car. And my heart just sunk. Because that's the landscape that I was driving on. I was running out of power. I had just stood about all I could stand. And my heart was breaking. You know what I remembered? I remembered the times that I could have been better, I thought. I remembered the times that if I had been different, that her life would have been better. God, it's just like sticking me in the knife, in the heart with a knife. It'd kill me. And I was running out of power. And I did the things that I needed to get done. 
because I had enough power to do it. But boy, it was leaving. We got all of this tended to, and we got Sandy's body and Marceline and and Susan and I, just all kind of messy arrangements. And I tell you, when I went in that Mexican Takati funeral home and saw what it was like, it was the worst place I've ever seen, and my kid was in there. <clears throat> we went to San Diego to get on the airplane with she and the three of us. And I'd hit my low place, you know, the bottom had fallen out. And I looked over, and as close as me to Greg sat Jack Clater that you heard talk Friday night. I could not believe my eyes. And he had a damned old tie on, had butterflies all over it. <laughs> and he told me lately that he still had the tie. And when I saw him, guess what happened? <clears throat> the power came back. You see, that's what you're for. <clears throat> that's what we are to each other. In my humanness, with everything that I do, by reading the big book, and I go to those meetings, I really do. I am a good AA, and I'm faithful. And I do all these things. Every once in a while, I start running out of power. And I do believe that's the way God intends it. If we can't learn to lean on each other, we'll never, ever be able to lean on Him. And I said, Jack, we're in trouble. Boy, he popped up out of that chair like he'd found a tack in it. <laughs> Put his arms around me and hugged my neck. Now, we weren't together five minutes. You know, if it were possible for a human to live 512 years, and I happened to be that guy, <laughs> I'd never forget that experience, Jack, and I love you for it. I have done exactly what the big book suggested that I do from step one through step nine. And guess what? The power has been added. I'm full of it today. Because of, of what I'm doing, your lives will be touched. And because of what you're doing, my life is touched. That's the power. In just a little bit, we're going to close this meeting. <clears throat> With the Lord's Prayer. And have you ever stopped to think about whether you recite the Lord's Prayer or whether you pray the Lord's Prayer? After this conference this weekend, when we are dismissed at the end of this meeting, I, for one, am going to pray the Lord's Prayer in unison with you. I'm not going to recite it today. I have valid reasons for praying the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer at the end of it says these words. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For thine is the kingdom is my recognition of who and what he is. Now, any school kid knows if there's a kingdom, there's bound to be a king running around in there someplace. And I'm told where the kingdom lies. It's within me and it's within you. Have you ever stopped to consider your heritage? Have you ever just for a moment taken time out to consider who you really are? We are sons and daughters of God Almighty. And as such, that makes me a prince of the kingdom. And today I hope you, in, you join me in recognizing your heritage 
and knowing beyond all knowing that we here in this room are prince and princesses of his kingdom. And I'm going to tell you, I am claiming my heritage as of right now. I am a prince, and I'm going to act like one. I fully intend, because I have the power, to live and conduct my life in such a manner that someone someday just possibly might want to emulate it a little tiny bit. And that's the only hope I have ever had to help another human being. There is nothing I'll ever be able to say to you that will help you. There really isn't. But if I learn to live my life by following the principles and the precepts of this program, in a certain manner, it's possible that someday somebody just might want to emulate it, a portion of it, and they say, Bob, what is it you do? And boy, if you think I can't tell them, you don't know. <laughs> if I have an ability is to talk one-on-one -on -one with a person who's in trouble that's a drunk. And Mr. I can tell him that there is a way that is beyond his wildest imagination. And it's called the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it is his kingdom. And you and I are his children. And as such, I am a prince and you girls are the princes. And guess what's next? The power. For that is the kingdom and the power. It is his power. It has never been mine. If I have done one thing today, this is what I hope it is, is to have conveyed to you where there's no possible misunderstanding that I have never ever had the power to change myself. But God can and will, if so. God, I wonder what would have happened many years ago, probably nothing, if someone had told me, rest easy, cowboy. You can't change yourself. You really can't. You can quit butting your head against the wall. That's what you all have told me. You said, never again, one time, do you have to try to change yourself. You suit God and me okay just like you are. Now guess what that's called? Come on. How about acceptance? God accepts us just like we are. Why can't we accept each other just like we are? It's not your duty, you know, to see that I'm better. It's your duty, duty to accept me. It's mine to accept you. It's my deal. It's my deal to recognize wherein the power lies and plug in it, and therein lies change, called change in my life. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The words alcoholics anonymous is the glory. We give him the recognition, and we do not take it ourselves. I recognize today that whoever and whatever it is that I am as I stand before you is his glory. And that's the anonymity of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I just love every one of you. God bless you.